So, the most popular video game for the Atari 2600 was... Pac-Man. Pac-Man Pac Fever. The second most popular game for the Atari 2600 was a game called Pitfall. And in the fifth grade, I was addicted to Pitfall. Pitfall is a game where you jump up in the air over logs, scorpions, snakes, and at the you know, apex of the excitement, you actually jumped onto a vine and swung over gaping crocodiles of death. And before fifth grade, I was addicted to this game. I couldn't get enough. And my parents wouldn't buy the game for me. My friend Patrick had the game. And I would beg them, please buy me this game. And they said, no, we would deny you 10 minutes of sunlight. I said, what do you mean 10, 10 minutes of sunlight? And they said, well, you walk to Patrick's house, and that's 10 minutes. You get some sunlight, some exercise, and then you walk back home. If we buy you the game, you would never leave your room. I said, come on, please. And they're like, no, and we're on a budget, and you need school clothes, because school is starting. I'm like, come on, pitfall, close, pitfall, close, pitfall, close. <sighs> All right, whatever, cool. So school begins, and I'm in the fifth grade at Prescott. Any Pre Prescott alum? <laughs> Panthers in the house, okay. <laughs> and in the fifth grade, you were combined with the sixth grade for homeroom every morning. And the sixth graders would always come in late because they were, you know, at the precipice of junior high and they just didn't care as much. And I remember the first day walking in and looking at them and going, wow, that's, that's the real thing. And then the last member of the sixth grade class walked in. Her name was Abby. Pitfall no longer mattered. Clothes did, you know, irony. And she was wearing these great jeans in the front, acid wash, and on the back, just regular. And they're stunning. And I became obsessed with Abby. And we would be in the cafeteria, and they're like, what time are you coming over to play Pitfall? I'm like, Pitfall? No. Abby. When are we going to talk to Abby? You can't talk to Abby. You're in fifth grade. Why not? Come on, we got to try. No, she's out of your league. Whatever. I'm going to go talk to her. No, shush. Hey, Abby. Can I sit with you and your friends at the... Uh, can I sit with you and your friends? No. Oh, okay. Um, I gave you a piece of style, but no. Okay. All right. Th thanks. thanks. What are you doing? You're crazy. No. Come on. You gotta try. You have to try. How can you live and not try? Hey, Abby. I see you and your friends are playing Foursquare. Do you mind if I come and join you? And like, oh, okay. No. Okay. Th thanks. And my friends were telling me, give it up. It's a dream. It's 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 a figment. You'll never it, you'll never attract her attention. And so, in more irony, I did, I did seep into deep depression. I went into that room without pitfall, and I closed the doors, and I closed the blinds, and I listened to a lot of bad 80s power ballads. <laughs> and, I, and Sunday nights, I would call the dedication hotline. Yeah. Uh, this one goes to Abby. And then you would listen to see if Abby would return the favor. She never returned the favor. Um, and I was just in a deep, deep depression. And finally, my friend Patrick, the owner of Pitfall, was my savior, my St. Patrick. And one day he came over and he kicked down the door. <laughs> he opened the blind, sunlight streaming through. He picked me up. He said, you're coming over to my house and we are playing Pitfall. I said, OK. And we walked to his house. And we're walking into the door. There's a theme forming here tonight, people. As we're walking into the door, his German Shepherd dog, Belker, was coming at me. And he was coming at me like one of those killer crocodiles in Pitfall. And I looked up in the air for a vine. There was no vine. And the dog immediately began to attack me. Now, coincidentally enough, my mother had called to Patrick's parents to make sure I was there. I had arrived and I wasn't too depressed. <laughs> Hi, Dean. How are you? She's right back here. <laughs> They're talking on the phone. I'm screaming in terror in the middle of Ryan Street, and for some reason, they keep the conversation going. <laughs> Dean says, oh my goodness, the dog is attacking your child. My mother says in that quote, oh no, is he wearing his new clothes? <laughs> yes, mom, and they're tattered and bloody. I like to tell people that I took Belker by the ears and I bit him back. That's not true. 
Velcro threw me up in the air like a rag doll, <laughs> repeatedly. Finally, seven kindly good Samaritans dragged the beast off of me. I lay bloody in the middle of Ryan Street. The Finnegans pick me up. They take me two blocks to Lincoln General. We go into the ER. There's no paper signing. There's no waiting. This is true trauma. Get into a bed. They get me to a bed. I lay down. And there's a bright white light up, up in the air. And I'm looking at this bright white light. And I see my first birthday. Second birthday. <laughs> The car I would never have. <laughs> and then as the, as the light dimmed into the ether, I saw Abby's face. <laughs> and I was rested in the comfort to know that the end of my mortal days would end with that face. After they gave me four stitches, um, <laughs> I, I came too. And, a, and a, I don't know, a police officer walked in and he said, Mr. Maley, uh, I have to ask you a question. Would you like us to destroy the dog or do you want the dog to live? I said, what? He said, we can destroy the dog or would you like the dog to live? I said, well, this is interesting. How the tables have turned. <laughs> predator is now the hunted and the hunted is now the predator. Wow, really? I said, bring Patrick in. Patrick comes in, tears, snot, screaming, don't kill my dog, don't kill my dog. I said, I don't know, Patrick, it's kind of, kind of strange how it all worked out. He said, I'll do anything. I said, anything? I'll loan you pitfall, the dog lives. <laughs> Papers were thrown in the air. I was hoisted on the shoulders of doctors and nurses. It was a beautiful celebration of life, which could have been there. And I went home, and my parents were so loving. They said, you're so frail. You're, you, you really shouldn't go to school. You should stay at home. We're going to go to work. Pitfall. Ding, ticka, ding, ticka, ticka, ding, ding. Day two. I may get out of bed, but collapse. Get back in bed. We're going to work. Pitfall. Ding, ticka, ding, ticka, ticka, ding, ding. Day three. I almost make it to the front door. Collapse. Get back in bed. We're going to work. Pitfall. Ding, ticka, 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 ticka. Now, while I was on my video game sabbatical, there was an empty desk at Prescott Elementary, and children were worried, what happened, where is he? And my savior, St. Patrick, did not disappoint me. You should have seen the blood. You should have seen the terror, bones. And he let the dog live. When I returned to Prescott in that cafeteria, I'm walking with my Fiestata tray, and a voice came out, hey, Come sit with us. Yeah, yeah who's Abby? <laughs> sure. Recess. We're playing Foursquare. Come play with us. It's Abby. Okay, I guess I... Yeah, sure. I'll do that. Folks, there were two good weeks. Two solid good weeks. And uh, then a kid fell off a roof, breaking both his legs. The dog story went page one, page four, page seven. <laughs> page seven. <laughs> And so the lesson to be learned here tonight is twofold, folks. Number one, to attract uh, the affection of other people it often requires trauma and a humanitarian act of courage. <laughs> and number two, it's what our city's namesake once said, Abe Lincoln, and that is fame is often vapor, it's often just up in the air. Thank you. Uh -huh. <laughs>